Virginia Klausmeyer, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, let's let's talk about um, changing the world. Tell us, uh, first of all, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Just kind of set the stage. Yeah, well, um, so I started a company about eight years ago. So it's been in the making, starting um, off of some technology that my late father developed. Um, and just a little bit about me that's useful for context. Uh, my background's been in science um, and then in business. And then I uh, ended up taking some of these early developments that he'd been focused on to really change the whole world um, and looking at it from a carbon lens. How do we, how do we massively change the carbon um, that is being out there today in all of our general everyday activities? So that's, uh, it's kind of a small, not a small challenge to address. <laughs> well, let's, so like, yeah, well, I want to come back to all that interesting stuff, but let's like, let's, let's lay the groundwork around, like, what's the deal with carbon, right? We're hearing a lot about carbon credits, carbon neutrality, um, but, you know, it's a molecule, right? It's everywhere. Can you give us kind of a, a, a framework for understanding all, everything that you're thinking about carbon? Yeah, and I, I think that the message has simplified around carbon, but um, really like methane and a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, gases that come off of industrial applications and traditional transportation go up to the atmosphere and cause problems that result into um, climate warming and the cooling, uh, or sorry, the warming of the planet, which ultimately results into a plethora of problems <laughs> that we're seeing. So um, on the West Coast, just to name a few that are very prevalent, you have the fires, um, crazy storms, um, uh, the droughts that are occurring. And, you know, I think everyone in the world is starting to become pretty affected by the effects of climate change, which ultimately is a result from um, us humans being on the planet and our ways of living. Uh huh. And so is it just that there's so many of us that, you know, like occasionally, like, I'll want to have a fire in my backyard, and get some fallen limbs and trees. And I'm, what, I'm worrying, like, am I destroying the atmosphere? But, you know, humans have done that for a long time, but there's just so many of us, or is it that we're doing, we're you, doing fundamentally different things? Um, I would say both, uh, you know, so I think that's why the problem is so big because you it's compounded by a number of variables. So one, you have um, a pretty, you know, the population is pretty populated <laughs> and, um, and it's mm -hmm. trending, you know, still in a significant way. Um, so um, there's some good and bad effects on that. Um, but also, you know, each person uses a lot of energy um, and a lot of overall carbon emissions from the food they eat to the clothes they wear. You know, so these are really everyday um, everyday acts <laughs> from the water they drink to the light they turn on um, and then the cars they get in. And so all of these pieces add up and um, separate from just burning a fire, um, you know, if I think um, that fire is kind of the earliest source of energy, right? So if you were in a non-populated place and didn't have all the other things around you, like that, you know, that, that we have in our normal everyday life, um, I would imagine that carb that fire is pretty low carbon impact compared to all the other, all the other pieces that we have around us. <laughs> okay, so I, I remember first being woken up to this when I watched Al Gore's documentary mm. and Convenient Truth. And at the end, he's got like 11 things you could do. And they were like, change your light bulbs, put in low flow shower heads. It was mm. like all of the onus was on the consumer, mm. the end user of the product. And so a lot of us, you know, and then there was this book, 50 things you can do to save the earth, you know, recycling, using cloth instead of plastic bags. And like you're, you're focusing on an entirely different point in the mm. supply and creation and use chain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all those points um, that were made were are really good. And I think the, you know, big value is it, it draws into making you as a consumer aware of your impact at small stuff that hopefully also makes you aware of the big stuff. So just to give you a, a sense like that, the energy, um, energy as a whole, so lights um, and fuels that takes up, that makes up about like close to 75% of the carbon emissions 
globally annually. So, you know, consumer products are a big, are a big part because a lot of energy goes into making them and moving them around, et cetera. But, um, you know, when you're actually looking at um, keeping people warm and transportation and all of those sort of other effects, those are really big pieces of the pie. Hmm. And I would say a little bit less out of consumer's control um, initially. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, when I go to the store and I buy food, and it's packaged food, it'll, they'll have a nutrition facts label. And mm -hmm. it will tell me how many calories, how many grams of fat, vitamins, things like that. Uh, but I really have no, no sense of the energy that went into, you know, the light bulb that I buy, mm -hmm. or the kiwi that I get. Um, is, is it because we don't like, it's really hard to tell, like, is, are they like, are, do those measurements exist or, you know, like we just don't get told, like I, I was, I was reading <laughs> yeah. the other day that like, you know, it's probably better to use plastic bags than to buy a cl a cotton made bag mm. and that you'd have to use the cotton made bag 7,000 times to, and I'm like, oh, but you know, look at me uh, with my cotton bag. I feel so virtuous. Yeah, no, and you're completely, and that's the thing that, um, like, this is a challenging problem to, um, to understand. What I think you initially pointed out is some type of um, number or score of um, how, you know, how much carbon was attached to that product because I know the cost of it um, it's not usually or, captured into the cost right now so there are becoming more sophisticated um, uh, understanding about it's called like the life cycle so you look at the life cycle of something from you know from the beginning of life so did it use your generative um, uh, planting purpose you know uh, agricultural um, aspects things like that so it has a lower carbon footprint um, and then does it, you know, and then is it local, et cetera. So all these things are starting to be factored in. I think we're pretty far away from the consumer actually getting an actual score um, on like a, a bag of chips, <laughs> but uh -huh. you're starting to see more brands, you know, um, that are actually um, doing a really good job on talking about their impacts on how they've mitigated any CO2 um, for that product. So you are starting to see a lot of products that are doing a great job of transparency, which, which is a, you know, uh, it's a hard thing to do. It takes money and energy to do that. Um, and one of the things kind of to that point that's pretty interesting is you're starting to see automotive, uh, the automotive industry do the same. So they're looking at eventually when you buy a car, <laughs> you'll see the um, carbon impact of mm. that car. Mm. I imagine there must there there must be some sort of resistance to being the first person, the first company, to to announce it. Like I'm thinking about like when I read about like this um, pound of almonds took thirty two thousand gallons of water or something to produce. Like I have no frame of reference for that. That sounds like a hell of a lot. You know, but then, you know, you compare it to beef or lentils or something else. And I, but like for, for companies to be the first ones to go out there and say, like, this is how much carbon our product is using might like be a PR um, nightmare for them. You know, it could, but usually the people that are highlighting the problem are the ones that have actually a solution. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's, <laughs> so I think that that's, um, uh, that's good. And that's also, part of it is that there needs to be more awareness and more support in um, organizations that do take that direct transparency approach because they are uh, really highlighting the problem and trying to show how they're addressing it from their angle or their, their piece of it. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're completely right. You know, I think um, one of the things that's um, hard to do is um, really figure out how to market to a, a large um, sort of the, the, like broad consumer uh, on these confusing complex mm -hmm. topics. Right. I mean, the other thing I'm thinking is that most of the things that I have overtly done to be better, to contribute less to climate change have been, have been costly to me, whether, you know, whether it's a trivial cost, like $5 for a bag mm. or, you know, taking 
few, you know, shorter showers or turning down the thermostat, like they're virtue things that I do at some sacrifice. Mm. And, and I'm, I, you know, like, I don't think that's how the world changes, right? Because even mm. like, like, well, there's not enough people in a position to do that, you know, just to a certain extent, I feel very privileged in that I can take these steps and it doesn't materially affect my quality of life. But I'm, wor- I'm wondering with like, you have a company that's, that's trying to solve these big problems. Are, is there a way to make climate remediation profitable so that it's, it, you know, that people want to do it, companies want to do it because it's better for them. And it's not just, um, you know, virtue signaling. Yeah, and there's been a really big pivot. Um, so I think that like just sort of taking your example that you offered, um, you know, when you're looking at taking a, a sh- shorter shower or using less, you know, turning off some lights that in general might feel like it's a, you know, it, you're taking away from your quality of life. Um, you're also saving money. And one of the things is actually looking at that cost savings differential and valuing that. So those, those um, the, the water and the real cost of what it takes to provide that water and the real cost of what it takes to provide that energy um, is gonna start coming up to the consumer. So it's actually better for you um, to use less of those, you know, less of those things. And I, um, so we're starting to see a pretty big pivot point where renewable energy and renewable, you know, materials, you could say just the right choices (laughs) or like the lowest impact are starting, you know, the people have been working on this stuff for decades. You know, my father worked on it for decades before I did. And, um, And you're starting to see those uh, solutions become at least on par with um, already existing like basic petroleum chemical solutions or other things like that. Um, Or in some cases even be cheaper um, when it comes to energy. So there's there's a really big turning point that's exciting um, and really catalyzing a lot of investment for scale up in this space now. Yeah, right, right. Although I once Mm -hmm. made the mistake of calculating how much money I saved by turning off lights. Mm-hmm. And it comes out to, you know, pennies a year. And at the same time, my energy provider, Duke Energy, is polluting the hell out of my state, right? Yeah. They've, got, you know, they've got these ash and in, in runoff into lakes and streams. And so there's, there's a, there, like, if I wanted them to pay for that, like my energy would be a lot more expensive, but because so much of economics is based on these externalities that the companies yeah. don't have to pay for, and therefore I don't have to pay for, there's no real sense of gain, even, you know, because the money I'm saving is, is so minuscule because I'm, you know, I'm, I may end up paying for it in terms of disease later on, or you know, yeah. health insurance premiums or, uh, you know, crappy food. Um, do you, do you see a movement in, in the business world towards, um, accounting better for, Come, for all the harms? Yeah. And one of the things I'm just going to take that, cause that was a really like tangible example is, you know, when you look at your local energy provider, that's using all this dirty energy and polluting your local environment, you're also losing cause you lose that access to that beautiful environment. Right. So there's. There's, I think, in people's awareness to those effects are becoming a lot stronger. Most, you know, a big, a big um, account for it could be that uh, people had to stay home and increase their awareness of what's happening around them, <laughs> and, mm. you know, and they had to stay more localized, and and then they started to see, huh, this isn't, you know, this looks pretty toxic. I can't swim in that river. That's not okay. Why not? You know, and they started to ask more questions. Um, so the impacts to communities are significant and um, and you are starting to see changes in weather patterns and things like that that are really tangible that are affecting um, most people um, at, at different levels but it is a little bit more removed you don't you don't immediately say oh I'm going to turn off my switch and then I'm not going to have a fire that's you know all, all summer long right that's not how it's not that direct but um, you know, I, I do, um, there is a pretty big shift that's happening and it comes really starting from the money sources. So a lot of money sources are pushing for, um, 
large organizations to have an awareness around their environmental um, effects and to actually be mitigating them or counting for them in some way. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of really uh, large um, money, you know, the, the sort of money that moves all the economy, um, like BlackRock, et cetera, are really see um, if you don't have an, a, um, if you don't have a solution to have uh, that's cleaner burning or things like that um, and less polluting, then you're not going to survive, right? So that's not where the future is going is to pollute more. <laughs> that's, that's not where I think anyone believes is true. Um, but like the, the sort of problem is we do need to have good solutions that are much cleaner and, um, you know, potentially even lower in cost to really um, have that double win for the consumer and, um, and also for the economy and our long term change. Gotcha. Well, I think that segues us nicely into your company, Silvatex, mm. right, which which is doing stuff, right? You're <laughs> uh, creating the technologies so that these impulses don't just have to say stay uh, wishes. So tell us just um, they briefly like what are, what are the technologies that you're that you're working on? Yeah, well, the um, so again, we're we're a climate tech company, so we're focusing and we've looked at solutions. The way the lens we use is where can we make the biggest impact? So overall, how can we significantly reduce carbon emissions? Um, so we've tackled the energy sector, which is um, that I mentioned accounts for almost seventy five percent of the carbon problem. And we've been using all of uh, our sustainable chemistry platform, which, I, you know, let's unpack that. It's pretty much empowered by plants. So what we did was we used biomaterials, so um, all plant-based materials to do chemistry. So instead of doing, I'm um, using more traditional chemicals that come from um, petroleum and, and oil, um, we use um, regenerative materials and we apply them to areas that can really enable a significant change. So our whole lens um, has been one, we need to empower solutions that massively reduce carbon, but also we, um, we don't assume that people will pay more. They actually have to pay significantly mm -hmm. less <laughs> to adopt the solutions. Um, and we've applied our technology to uh, EV battery materials, What's EV? To massive, EV, sorry, um, the electric vehicles. So changing into the, the sector of electric vehicles and really making the battery materials in a much, much more um, efficient way. So they're much lower in cost, but also have a lot lower carbon footprint. Gotcha. So, so let me unpack, make sure I understand this. Yeah. So it's, it's the idea of sustainable chemistry from plant-based sources is that like, you can grow plants again and again Whereas it takes a lot longer to to grow shale oil or petroleum, right? Like you know, like millions of years, right? For that, for yeah, that, yeah, it's process. not considered regenerative. <laughs> 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 yeah. right. So, so that by, by using plants, you can you don't we we can keep oil in the ground. Correct. Right. Um, and so, like when I first heard, heard about like you know plant-based energy sources, it was in the uh, the context of biofuels, mm -hmm. right? Like, hey, let's just burn them. And I've seen a lot of analyses that suggest that maybe you know corn for for biodiesel or or, or ethanol is not the greatest thing in the world. Is this are you, is this what you're talking about, or are you talking about like something fundamentally different? Um, something fundamentally different, but similar in scope. So um, biofuels are, if you look at the full life cycle analysis of the carbon from um, growth to processing, like to actually burning, uh, they are better compared to conventional, but they're still not the best. So you're starting to see a movement um, away from even liquid fuels for automotive vehicles into electrified vehicles so that you don't have the tailpipe emissions that come out every day as we fill our vehicles. Okay. So then what what does it look like to turn a to have to you know plant chemistry? Like what are you turning the plants into? Yeah, so and um I apologize because this is you know our 
our approach is definitely looking at impacting big industrial applications. <laughs> so most people don't have, um, you know, a common sense uh, around that. But what what our technology does is we use plants to really make build molecules together at a nano scale. So we use sort of the power of science to make that happen, and we're right now applying it so that the materials that are in batteries um, usually take a lot of energy to make um, and they can use a lot of water and um, are not as efficient and our chemistry allows them to be much much more efficient of a process so it's not that it's bio-based um, is really the factor it's sophisticated science but mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what's unlocking the benefits. Um, uh -huh. But we think it's really important that it has to be bio-based so that we're not um, sort of solving the problem with something that is um, also going to be depleting. Gotcha. So we're not talking about like potatoes, pennies, and lemon juice batteries. No, exactly. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about Tesla's batteries um, you know, all of the major OEMs that are making their batteries uh, and making it so that their their vehicles um, and their batteries are made in a much more efficient way. Gotcha. So what, what are the compounds now that are expensive and environmentally costly that, that are going into batteries and being depleted? Well, the, the biggest thing um, that you probably hear about is when you're looking at the battery, especially lithium ion batteries, um, what's being used for the foreseeable future is mining these materials can, you know, one, it's um, not regenerative. <laughs> so again, you're mining a resource that's finite. And that's like lithium and nickel and cobalt. Um, so you're hearing about all these materials. Uh, the process of turning them into the uh, materials that are used in the battery takes a lot of steps. And also there's a lot of waste. Um, in our using our chemistry, we're able to massively um, increase the efficiency and reduce that waste substantially. So we're making the materials come together in a much more effective way. and the sort of holy grail is um, is actually using recycled materials. So you're using end of life batteries after they get recycled, all the nickel and the lithium that comes out, um, you're putting that back into the process um, so that you have a full closed loop system is is how um, they think about it, which is that that's definitely the holy grail when you're looking at being really re renewable and really regenerative. Okay. So help, help me understand the idea of nano molecules, nano particles, right? My brain obviously can't picture it, <laughs> yeah. um, but is the idea that we we're now we now have the technology to reduce things to such fundamental levels to the individual little Legos that we can build anything? Um, somewhat, yeah. I mean, the the whole innovation with batteries has been um has been really groundbreaking where there the lithium ion is going back and forth is what's creating the energy that's allowing the movement of the vehicle or you know the lights to turn on etc um so it really you know the energy source is down to a molecular level always um it's just how you get that energy back and forth lithium has done um, is a really uh, good energy source. And from developments and innovation over the last, quite honestly, like 20 years, these batteries have gotten much, much, much more efficient um, so that we can start to use them uh, in vehicles and um, for other energy sources safely. Okay, so the, the lithium still has to be mined, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is mined there- Mined or recycled. Recycled. Okay, so it's but um, so it's a non-renewable resource, but I guess it could be you know recycled. You can recycle, it. yeah. So yeah, but um, I mean, like, does it does the same amount of lithium in the battery at the end of its life as the beginning? Um, no, you do have some. You definitely have some loss. There's a lot of work that um, is being done in the industry to try to. Um, really do some of the recycling in a much more efficient way so that you reduce as much loss. 
Um, but one of the things that's really important is as the market, so you're seeing all of the major OEMs. So the OEMs are the car manufacturers, BMW, VW, Ford, um, are really having electrified future. So that means all of their vehicles are gonna be electrified by 2030, 2050, everyone has a different roadmap. Um, and for that to be true, um, we need to, we as an industry needs to make sure we mine those materials using them really efficiently and we produce them in a much more effective way so that again, we don't create more problems for <laughs> globally um, uh -huh. with solving it in, you know, with, with um, integrating a new solution. Gotcha. But are, are we close to the point where we can make lithium out of air or... No, no. I mean, in, in lithium, um, I mean, I don't think that there's actually, I mean, lithium is, is um, its own mineral. So uh, it definitely has to come from something, but you can recycle it very well, right? So it's its own um, molecule. So it's not going to, you, you can't um, actually just synthetically make it at least to date, <laughs> I don't, I've never heard of anyone being able to work on that yet, but that maybe is in the future. Okay, because I was reading recently about like this idea of like biodigesters producing all our food, like at the molecular level, like, you know, here, it's a chicken, you know, made made by these fermentations. I'm wondering how, mm. how nano we can start to get around, put, you know, putting quarks and nuons and, and um, electrons together to, to make whatever yeah. we want. And food, you definitely can. Um, I mean, energy is a little bit different than than food because food definitely is carbon. You know, the base of everything is is pretty much carbon. Um, mm -hmm. So you can build, you know, like synthetic meats and things like that, which is what's happening a lot these days. Um, and you can theoretically um, take carbon from the atmosphere or different places and um, create the carbon change in the molecules that make different food that we eat I today. See. So you can, you know, that, that is, um, that is definitely coming out. Most of it is, um, focusing on high protein sources and, you know, of course it's easier to grow vegetables and things like that than synthetically make them. <laughs> I don't know mm -hmm. that's ever going to be, you know, that, that turning point is going to be, um, uh, say a, a wild one, maybe on Mars, that makes more sense to <laughs> synthetically make it. <laughs> You know, even, even Matt Damon was growing real potatoes on Mars. Right? Yeah. In that, in that movie. Exactly. Um, exactly. See, that's a, that's a really good point is that, you know, nature, um, nature does a really good job. So the closer we can get back to nature, the better. Uh-huh. Well, I think that's the, that's the inspiration for the name of your company, right? Like far Silva Forest Technology. Exactly. Exactly. Most people don't know that. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I knew it. I knew it as soon as I read it on your website. <laughs> yeah, the um, one of the things that's fun is um, has and has definitely inspired us is using the power of nature to make these, you know, new novel materials that are starting to be used and be synthesized because it is taking making building blocks up from a ionic scale or, a, you know, a molecular yeah. level. Um, so it is, you know, it seems like space age stuff, but really it's pretty, it's pretty simple and pretty amazing because the nature has been doing it for years very, very well. Right. Well, nature's pretty space aged. I mean, you ever look at like a spider web, like, I don't think we can make that yet. Yeah. There has been companies that have made spider silk. Um, oh, yeah? so they've been, yeah. So they've mimicked the same type of, um, I mean, because when you look also at nature, it's also incredibly efficient. So if you're not efficient, you don't survive. And so nature has done, you know, most of the time they do things very, very efficiently. They uh, versus us, right? <laughs> We're not yeah. natural. They, they are the natural ones. <laughs> but um, yeah, so looking, you know, there there is definitely a lot of um, a lot to learn from biomimicry, from looking at what happens in bio and mimicking it in different applications. So that definitely is a the way that we think. Um, a broader scale and then just applying it to these like huge industrial applications that usually are really polluting and trying to figure out how can we constantly mitigate um, the approaches mm -hmm. and think a little bit differently so that we can have a, a much better approach. Yeah, that's that's so interesting because the, you know, the biomimicry 
you know, it, it clearly works on sort of small scales because nature, nature mostly operates in sort of small scales, but there's also, but like, if you're trying to apply biomimicry to these giant systems that are human made, that are of scale much greater, but then I guess nature has huge scale as well. It's got climate, it's got, you know, the water cycle, like. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at like, even bees, for example, the amount of honey they make per their scale in just the way that they do it, it's pretty, there's a lot of energy that goes into their process, uh -huh. you know, and, and, you know, mushrooms, like there's just a lot of um, interconnected uh, processes. And I think nature has done a really amazing job at creating a, a wonderful harmony between them and us humans um, we don't like to harmonize with one another. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know, and that's, you know, I think um, what, you know, sort of going back to how you start, started to set up some of your reflections in this conversation is that, um, you know, it's kind of like we assume that we should have all of these benefits. We should have warmth. We should have light. We should have internet. You know, we should have good working zoom. We should have healthy food. Like these are, you know, we make these assumptions and, um, and it's kind of us versus them, but quite honestly, the whole, um, very few people on the planet can, can live as most people in the U S live today, um, and in other countries. So, um, that's, you know, it's definitely, we're not in harmony. <laughs> this is my big point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, I kind of want to get to the, um, sort of like the, the, the Marvel comic superhero angle to the story. It was like, your father was working on this and now you've taken over them. Like I can, you know, I can just see like the secret, you know, Alfred Lair with the test tubes and you like, what was, you know, tell me about your, your dad, what he, what he did and, and how, how it inspired you. Yeah. I, um, and, you know, looking back, it kind of was like that. Marvel <laughs> approach when I was younger, seeing him in the chemist outfit and, you know, and it took me until probably my mid, mid late twenties to really engage with what he was doing. Um, you know, cause most people, um, when you, you know, your parents are your parents, you really don't really fully understand what they do <laughs> and how, what, what impact they make. So it wasn't until I was in the world in kind of a big way that I really understood what he was doing. Um, and he, you know, he had a really interesting background where he started, um, with municipal science. So he started looking at, um, looking at chemistry from, um, for making pharmaceuticals and things. And then he took a lot of those learnings and actually wanted to apply them more into the environmental space. Um, so this is, you know, late seventies, eighties. Um, and so he transferred and, and went more into um, sort of this new world of bio-based um, regeneration. So he, he had a really a, a foundation from thinking about things at a, um, at a pharma level, which is really at a nano level. And then, um, and applying that into, um, into, energy. So, you know, he wrote papers with Argonne, which is one of the largest national labs and really game changing um, on ways to create energy, you know, from a full cycle from a human has waste that they produce. How do you turn that into energy and like food that can be used on Mars, you know, so that type of stuff um, he definitely worked on that's, uh, over his career. That's so interesting, because when I think about this late 70s and the energy situation, it was, you know, it was a lot of hippies, mm -hmm. right? It was sort of past, you know, post Earth Day and, you know, this like, you know, so holding up signs against nuclear, against coal. Um, but he sounds like, you know, very sort of straight laced, buttoned down scientist with this with sort of the same ethos and interests, but working at a very different level. He was um, a big hippie, though. <laughs> OK, so definitely part of that, definitely part of that, but just um, but, uh, you know, and I, I think one of the things too, that was nice is just through um, the stages of my early life um, moved us to Thailand. So I think he had a pretty good global view. And then um, back to Eugene, Oregon, where he started to, um, you know, do more of quite honestly, his garage work, which is where I kind of got involved. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where he started to do more of his development on looking at sustainable chemistry applications. He was applying it to the fuel sector. So to your earlier point, because that was really where there was a big shift away from 
full petro-based fuels and into more of the system we, we have today and the next generation of those. So he was working on next-gen fuels uh -huh. initially, which is where I got involved. Gotcha. And so what, what, what was your initial involvement? I mean, yeah, it was a, quite honestly a, a, an awakening that I just started to realize, you know, people started to ask me a little bit more about my family, you know, as I started to grow my career, my background, who's my family, what do they do? You know, and I think of my dad as a hippie artist that's a really smart scientist and, you know, we, we grew, so that, that was my frame. But then I started to ask a little bit more questions, you know, what have you been doing? How has that been going? And I, I really learned that over the last decade, he had done a lot of deep science and um, he was creating a fuel solution that not only um, uses sort of next gen materials, but could create a much lower emitting and much more, much lower polluting diesel fuel. Um, so AKA could change the world, right? <laughs> and, um, and I decided to start helping him out. Um, through that process, um, I learned a lot and was really, um, uh, was able to get him like start getting some grants and funding and, you know, use my network um, to really expand. And unfortunately he got pancreatic cancer and passed away pretty abruptly. So that was a big pivot point for me in my life mm, on sorry. questioning yeah, sorry. what to do. <laughs> sorry to hear that. When, when, yeah. when, when was that? When did he die? Yeah. And that was about um, a little over a decade ago. Uh -huh. So it was before you started Silvatex. Yes. Yes. It took me a couple of years to really, um, uh, understand the impact of what had been, you know, initially created. And, and, um, and for me, you know, I was on a completely different life uh, trajectory working in larger organizations and um, had a really, I was, I don't want to say like more standard high, you know, traditional approach to life and then quit all that and pitched in Silicon Valley and started my company the next day. Wow. And, and it's been eight years. Yeah. It's been about eight years. Um, and we really initially launched with the focus of the fuel application and through that working with, um, like the department of agriculture and a, a number of different institutions, we learned a lot more about the science that is allowing for some of the outcomes that we were seeing. Um, and then that gave us really a, a different way to see the world. And, um, a couple years ago, we took a really big look at where, where we could add a you know, massive value, right, into the supply chains, because most of these technologies, there's, they're platforms, meaning you can do lots of things with them. So you really have to focus your attention on an area where you can add a lot of value. And for us, adding a lot of value meant something that we could create a lot of um, financial returns, but also massively reduce the carbon profile. So we started to take our technology and apply it to making these nanomaterials, knowing that that was an area that was going to grow with the growth of sort of the new energy future. Um, and we really wanted to make sure those industries developed in such a way that they are, um, they're, you know, not becoming heavily polluting and they're very efficient, et cetera. So we really, um, I would say our bets paid off now, <laughs> given that that industry is really blo blossoming, um, which is which is wonderful, and I you know I think really good for the overall planet. Yeah, has Silicon Valley changed in the eight years in terms of like mm. let's say the 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 valence they put on profits versus like um, saving the earth? <laughs> um, no. But I think that the way that um, the businesses has changed, so it's not um, save the earth or make profit. I think they're, they are, um, you know, and you're starting to see this um, with a lot of uh, money in big institutions is that there is a strong belief that the future, you know, if you're trying to build something for them, you know, to be the game changing solution in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, it has to be sustainable, meaning it has to be able to like, um, you know, not pollute as much and have all these issues um, and uh, and ex extract from um, the environment and communities as much because, you know, generally that is that is not sustainable. So that is not going to be an approach that will survive in the growing awareness um, and government awareness with um, pollution and climate change, et cetera. Mm. So I do so think that there's, yeah, some big um, I do, I do believe that there is some changing in mindsets on a pretty uh -huh. big scale. So you, um, started this company was by yourself or with, 
with partners? By myself, I definitely had some founding, um, I call them advisors. So a lot of supportive people that were um, incredible cheerleaders <laughs> along the path and have mm -hmm. been with me on this, you know, windy road, um, which I'm incredibly grateful for. So, so yeah. and you're, you're, you think of yourself as a, or at least when you started, you were the scientist, right? Uh, I actually, I mean, I definitely know the science, but I quickly realized that my lane is more in the application of applying it in the business sector. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, we definitely have had the pleasure of um, recruiting highly technical support. Gotcha. So, how, so I'm curious about like your trajectory from founder with an idea based on your family's, you know, pedigree to becoming a leader. Like what, 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 yeah. what, what, what challenges have you discovered and overcome on that path? Wow. Okay. Let me, let me simmer on that for a second. Cause it's been a lot, <laughs> I think, you know, I think, so I'm just going to kind of give a few, um, a few pivot points, um, through mine. One was just starting the company. Um, so for that, you know, one, I, um, I really quite honestly had to have significant loss in my life where it made me really think about what I want to do. And if I died tomorrow, would I be proud of the work I did? Or, you yeah. know, it, so those really big fundamental things, it's like struggles. Like I, you know, I got that reflection moment with losing somebody so close to me and other loss that I had at that time period. Um, so that point, um, that was a really, um, a really big shift in struggle, um, but it empowered me to actually make, you know, really invest in the world I want to see and I want to live in. And that's been mm. the foundation that I, you know, I move on every day. I want to talk to good people like you. I want to, um, you know, I want to expand in areas that are significant. So that was a really big shift um, for me. And then there was uh, actually building the company and becoming a leader um, for better, or for worse. In my area, there's not very many women leaders that have traditionally been in sort of hard science um, and in business combined. So I've really tried to attract to people that I can relate to um, because, you know, gender is one thing, but I think it, you know, it does, it, it's valuable to see, um, uh, see people kind of that you relate to um, in positions that you want to go into. So that's been something that, um, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely tried to manage, but has probably been my personal struggle, um, has realized that, you know, it's not just the traditional people that you see that are the ones that can create change. I can do that too. And I can learn along the way and I can, and I have the power, you know, we're all people, we all have the potential, mm -hmm. right? So, um, mm -hmm. really that humbling process, um, is a constant, um, yeah, a constant theme. So do you, I'm really curious about this because there's, you know, in terms of like, you know, diversity and mm -hmm. um, equity in the workplace, especially around, you know, around gender issues, um, there's, there's been sort of a movement for women to be able to do whatever men do to be, you know, mm -hmm. so, and of course there's all the, the, the issues that go with that around like, am I being a boss or am I being bossy, am, right? Like the double standards, but I'm also, I'm also beginning to see women taking leadership roles and saying, I don't have to do it the way men do it. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, I'm wondering in this field in which, you know, in this, this sort of fundamental change, like it's, it feels to me a very feminine approach to say, let's look at nature and see what we can learn as opposed to let's see what we can extract or control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you think of yourself as a, a leader who draws upon your experience as a woman in your leadership? Mm. I mean, the short answer is yes. Like what I've learned and what all the research, um, you know, in human development tells us is the closer that you can become to yourself and your unique attributes and um, X factor, the more you're gonna bring into the world, right? So I think it's been really valuable for people to settle in and be like, oh, I am a woman, <laughs> like that makes sense. I can add value as I am. I don't need to just, I don't need to pretend um, you know, or fit into fit into this process that the world has been built around for a traditional, you know, um, I mean, traditionally more white male. So you're starting to see a shift of, um, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's, I don't want to be that. I think it's more like, oh, I'm much more effective as a human when I really am comfortable 
um, being me and realizing that there's value being me because um, at least for me, there's, you know, about half of people on the planet like me. So that's a pretty big number. <laughs> and then, you know, and then the more, um, you know, sort of taking that one layer further is that being, a, you know, being a mom. So not only is it, um, you know, sort of taking the risks on the entrepreneurial journey, but then um, it really was, you know, becoming a mother. And, you, you know, I think that there's in the workplace and especially right now, you're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of women leaving the workplace because it does not work for them in their ability to be, you know, a manager at home and a manager um, in their, in their job and workplace. So, um, you know, I'm really hoping that that's going to change and um, people have, and that there's been a big spark of being able to create more equitability um, for, um, for division of labor so that we can have uh, a broader diversity of you know, perspectives and um, in the workforce. Gotcha. And what, what and um, how about being a leader in your organization? You have to make tough decisions, right? You have to yeah. balance individual needs. Um, what's that journey been like? Yeah, every day, every day, every day, it's a new journey. So that's one exciting. <laughs> that's definitely one exciting thing. Um, you know, I think um, in the entrepreneurial journey, you definitely have to get really comfortable with making decisions with very little information, which is really uncomfortable. It's not what most people like to do. Um, so I've gotten really comfortable, um, you know, in that process. Uh, and that's, I think, applied well <laughs> for also becoming a mom and managing a lot um, at home <laughs> because you just, you know, there's really not usually one right answer. There's a lot of different paths to success. Um, so it's maintaining that flexibility <laughs> and, and being open-minded that I think has been really, really valuable. And I think for me, one of the big things that I've, um, I've really, uh, I don't want to say like learned, but um, I'm trying to manifest more of is the more, you know, not just like pushing through with trying to make things happen, but the more that I, you know, I allow the solutions to unfold <laughs> and that I um, relax into uh, each hurdle <laughs> that, uh, that applies, I am able to really um, shift my focus and, uh, and come up with solutions on an easier uh, bandwidth, if that makes sense. So I, um, yeah, one of my big themes is um, happy people are much more efficient. We know that they're about 33% more efficient. So whatever I can do to maintain happiness, um, mm -hmm. I will be a better leader and a better person all the way around. So however that, however I do that is good. <laughs> gotcha. And as and it sounds like you're you're um, becoming more and more successful, and presumably you're gonna gonna need to grow. What what about your um, growing the leaders under you to be to be leaders is that is that a, a factor right now yeah completely so um i mean one within our organization um spending a lot of time with i mean right now we have a pretty small organization so it's fairly um easy but we definitely want to grow and expand that significantly as we start and incorporate that into our growth um is those models and you know a big part of it is real transparency is meeting people where they're at so I'm happy you brought that up because one of the plugs I wanted to make is a couple of entrepreneur um, friends and myself started a, an award called the Pandemic Super Moms Award. Um, and it's definitely focused on um, getting the stories out of people and how they manage through, which is part, you know, was inspired by a lot of our employees that just did a really good job. Um, and there's a lot of stories out there of how people have been able to kind of finagle doing it all <laughs> and uh -huh. teach teach leaders like us on how we can do it better and how we can create um, a better work environment that allows that flexibility that's needed to manage through a pandemic and through parenting. <laughs> mm. have, have you been touched by the great resignation? The, oh, I mean, definitely, um, completely. I think, you know, early on in the pandemic, we definitely saw that. Um, and then uh, in a lot of my um, cohort and just in my general personal life, I definitely have seen a, a significant amount of shifting within people and specifically women in the, in the work. I mean, it's been specifically from my anecdotal evidence women um, mm -hmm. and also what you're seeing in the numbers more broadly. Uh -huh. So do you, um, are you able to attract and maintain talent right now? 
Is it hard? Yes, um, we we definitely had some um, shifting that occurred over the last 18, you know, 24 months, which I think has been similar to a lot of organizations. The, you know, the world changed so much. Um, and what we're doing is trying to create a lot of flexibility within our, um, in, in how people work to be able to count for how to manage their home life as well. So I think that that's been something um, that has attracted support. And I, you know, I've heard my team at least acknowledge um, that they're, uh, they like the ability to work for somebody that's very open about their homes, you know, their home personal life and just all the pieces and try to sort of have a, a more of an empathetic leadership style. Um, mm -hmm. It makes them feel safer um, to talk about things versus just having it be binary, like you're working or you're not, because we're, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all humans, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, Pandemic Supermoms Award as something you wanted yes. to highlight. Anything else you want to talk about that I uh, haven't asked about? Um, well, yeah, this has definitely been a fruitful discussion a lot. Um, I, I look forward to hearing the response um, from your listeners. And I, I definitely would like to uh, put that plug there. Hopefully in the show notes or something, we can put a link to the Su Pandemic Supermoms Award. But you can nominate yourself or you can nominate somebody else um you get a lot of uh you get some money and goodie bags um, from women-based organizations so definitely want to get as many of those stories out there and our goal with the whole campaign is to highlight people and just their creativity of managing through and their resilience um that you know being a, a mom really um grows that skill and being able to uh, have it shine uh, among leaders in the workplace to hopefully support more of the movements that allow flexibility and workability um, to, to get more women back into the workforce that we've seen. Great. And for people who are not going to look at the show notes, is there a website for it? Yes. So you can go to Cooley Cooley, uh, their website, and look for the Super Moms campaign. How do you there. spell that? Cooley Cooley? <laughs> Yeah, it's sorry, it's uh, K U L I, K U L I. Okay. Cooly Cooly. Cooly Cooly dot um, com and look for Super Moms. Yeah. I think I spelled that right. Hold on one second. My apologies. No worries. No worries. See, this is why people should always check out the show notes. Oh, coolycoolyfoods.com. Coolycoolyfoods.com. Cool yep. Super moms. Yep. Okay, great. So I'll definitely put that in the show notes. And uh, yeah, be, uh, that's uh, be an amazing thing to highlight and people. To and also, um, one other thing is just pay attention to what's happening um, with COP26 and um, at local and um, you know, at your local level and wherever uh, around uh, climate change and um, environmental effects, because, uh -huh. the, you know, change is here, um, but, and there's a lot happening in the communities from global level, like you're seeing at COP26 to um, down to domestic and everyone in their own community. So there's a lot that can happen and change. It's, it's really exciting. Awesome. So, so before you go, paint us a picture. So Silvatex is incredibly successful. What are we seeing in the world in five years? Mm, I love that picture. Um, so in five years, you're going to see that um, there's more uh, like domestic production. So in the US, you're going to see and, you know, at, at every like sort of region locally of batteries and um, and vehicles that are going to be coming into the supply chain. Um, and the reason why that matters is because it, it means that that's, that equals jobs um, and that equals more sustainable energy and lower carbon profiles. Um, and you're starting to see a transition um, from traditional energy to um, having energy storage that is, is taking place. So um, that really changes the, the actual emissions that are being emitted from coal and other, other types of traditional energy sources. Um, and so you're, you're seeing this sort of growth um, in the marketplace of these, of these jobs. And all of that is done in a, you know, I like to use the word harmonious way. <laughs> so um, all of those industrial um, solutions are 
somewhat closed loop. So they're not impacting um, sort of the localized communities where they're located and expanding. So that's kind of where we come in and our, our dream and vision is really to bring us to that next uh, generation solutions, but in a much more sustainable way. Gotcha. So for us, yeah, that means yeah. that we're, we're expanded uh -huh. pretty significantly with that, um, all of those, those, the new techs that are coming online. Okay, and as the consumer, the end user, do I get better battery life? Is my car mm. more powerful? Is it yes. easier to charge? Do it, is it easier to swap out when it's done? Oh, great question. So you're going to have a much easier life. One is it's going to be lower. It's going to be cheaper. Um, two, you're going to be able to look at your vehicle and have a sticker on there. And it's going to say how much carbon it took to, to actually produce that vehicle. And it's going to be a lot lower um, than what it's been traditionally before. So you're going to have that clarity and you're going to have all the performance elements that you're, you're seeing. So right now in a lot of our government, there's um, been a big infrastructure change to support the growth of EVs. So it's going to be easier to plug in, easier to fuel up, um, lower in cost for you um, in a substantial way as, as a consumer, because you're not having to maintain buying this energy source and this fuel. Okay, gotcha. So my final question it might be a little bit hardball, but um, there's there's a movement that I'm aware of that kind of really distrusts technology as mm -hmm. a solution because they you know see technology has always been the problem, right? Yeah. So so we think about like you know one way to solve transportation is public transportation. Another way is give everybody their own self-driving flying car. Right. And, you know, so yeah. like, um, what do you, what do you see in terms of like, can, can technology lead us to what you talk about this sort of harmonious way of living on the world? Or is it just sort of, you know, um, shaving off the rough, the roughest edges of our capitalist ego driven society? Oh, yeah, that is a very loaded question. We could probably talk an hour about that question, <laughs> but the, um, you know, um, the way that I think about it is that we, you know, we, um, there's a lot of humans on this planet and we use a lot of um, resources. So we need to scale those back at a pretty significant level. Um, so even though technology definitely can create more consumerism or have unintended effects, right, that we don't want to see, um, you know, I, and I'm definitely of the, of um, the approach where we have to reduce um, reduce the amount of energy we use. So that means, yeah, use the public buses, compile, get people closer together so that we can have much more efficient, you know, efficient solutions. And that bus should be fueled off of um, electrification and electrification should be coming from wind powered energy or different renewable resources, right? So that's, it's sort of a, a hybrid of all of the solutions together, like stitching it all together that makes the really big difference. Um, and you know, it's, it's good to be skeptical of innovations because traditionally they have been driven from uh, actually just, you know, of making money. And, you know, I think that there is gonna be a lot of, um, sort of side things that may might not pan out um, that have big hopes and dreams. But um, for, you know, for us to make a big impact, we do need to be thinking more holistically about integrating like the, the solution so that we move around in a much more efficient way. And then everything that fuels that has to be much done in a much more effective way as well. All right. So all, all hands on deck, all approaches. All hands on deck. Yeah. Maintain your skepti skeptical ways, but make sure, you know, you start adopting and changing because um, it is definitely uh, the time to start looking ahead and, and how you want to um, reduce your impact. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Last question. You're a scientist. You're a visionary. Are you hopeful? I am very hopeful. I am very hopeful. Yeah, I am. I, I see a lot of change and I see a lot of amazing um, momentum with the younger generations, their awareness of the planet as a whole um, and the effects that we see on the climate is, um, it is something that I've never seen before. And I really do believe that they're gonna demand and drive that change they wanna see for the world they wanna live in. So I am hopefully part of that. <laughs> and I am very hopeful that the momentum is here and is maintained. All right, let's 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 go out on that note. Virginia Klausmeyer, <laughs> thank you so much for the work you're doing, for carrying on your father's legacy, for um, 
you know, helping to heal the world and for taking the time today. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, listening. Yep, you bet.